Today's topic is Exemplars of Divine Love, and it's the fourth in a series on the Narada Bhakti Sutras. Just a quick review for those who missed our last uh, talk. In Sutra 7 through 14, Narada explains in Sutra 7, Bhakti cannot be used to fulfill any desire, being itself the check to all desire. So what does that mean? People usually pray for the fulfillment of a desire, health, job success, friends, or to alleviate some personal problem, just as young Naren did when his family underwent financial troubles after the demise of his father. But when Sri Ramakrishna sent him three times to Mother Kali to pray directly to her, three times at the sight of her, Naren became ecstatic with love for her. He bowed to her repeatedly and prayed only for love and devotion. Such was the power of his vision of her. On the third time, overcome with devotion, Naran thought, what a trifle I have come to pray to the mother about. It's like asking a gracious king for a few vegetables. What a fool I am. Naran later related, in shame and remorse, I bowed to her respectfully and said, mother, I want nothing but knowledge and devotion. So in this incident, we see that genuine bhakti is the same as nirodha, what we read in Raja Yoga, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, the elimination of all desires. In Sutra 8, Narada explains, Renunciation means dedication of all activities, secular as well as sacred, to God. So performing selfless action, offering all our actions to God, secular and sacred, to our chosen ideal, brings devotion and desirelessness in its wake. Devotion to God is the most natural way to grow in renunciation, a word that a lot of people have problems with. It happens naturally. Sri Ramakrishna stated, bhakti, love of God, is the essence of all spiritual discipline. Through love, one acquires renunciation and discrimination naturally. Similarly, Swami Prabhavananda in his Narada Bhakti Sutras commentary explained that we must move toward God, pray for pure devotion, learn to love God. And as that love grows in our heart, passions will naturally come under control and our heart will cease to be attached to worldliness. He continued, Thus, the path of devotion is the most natural and the easiest to follow. Because as you think of God more and more, love will grow in your heart. And as love grows, discrimination, passion, and purity of heart will come to you naturally. Sutra 9. A bhakta's renunciation means that his whole soul Lords goes toward God, and whatever militates against love for God, he rejects. This is very high form of devotion to God. So what happens when we as devotees learn to develop one-pointedness in our devotion? What is the secret? Sri Ramakrishna explains so clearly. He said, as a tiger devours other animals, so does the tiger of zeal for the Lord eat up lust, anger, and the other passions. Once this zeal grows in the heart, lust and the other passions disappear. 
So it happens naturally. Vivekananda shared how to turn our passions toward God. He said, God is the one goal of all our passions and emotions. In other words, if you want to be angry, be angry with him. Chide your beloved, chide your friend. Say unto the beloved, why do you not come to me? Why do you, you leave me thus alone? So there's an intimate relationship that develops. Now we come to Sutra 10. Narada says, full soul devotion means giving up every other refuge and taking refuge in God. Well, how do we do this? By practicing all the four yogas. Reading the scriptures and scriptural study is essential to cultivating devotion to God. And as a byproduct, we develop the capacity for deep thinking and discrimination. We're not just ingesting what we hear, but we're actually cogitating about what we're reading and hearing. So Raja Yoga is another path. How does that help our devotion? By first understanding the nature of the mind, we're able to detach and witness the mind. Then we develop control over the mind. And once controlled, we can then turn the mind Godward, that it happens all together. Karma yoga is yet another way, another aid in cultivating devotion to God. By surrendering all our actions to God, we lessen our emotional investment in public opinion and increase our flow of thought toward God. How does jnana yoga help our devotion? The whole process of jnana is negating that which is unreal. What happens to a knower of Brahman? They are filled with ananda, the ananda of Satchit Ananda, that bliss, that love. And that bliss is the same as Sat, which is the same as Chit. And what happens to the ego? I had the privilege to meet such a soul at Belarmat, Swami Nirvanananda. When he was asked, have you a Attain that state that you were given the boon to attain by Swami Brahmananda. He said, through the grace of my Guru, through the grace of Sri Ramakrishna, I have surrendered everything. So there is that complete surrender that allows that flow of what we are, that Satchidananda, that pure Atman within, to flower and come forth. And we feel that bliss absolute, that love absolute within us. And when we arrive at the stage in our life, when we constantly remember God, we then realize he alone is our strength, our only refuge and our true friend. Sutra 11, to reject Whatever militates against love for God means performance of such secular and sacred activities as are favorable to devotion to God, to reject whatever militates. Swami Prabhupada again in his commentary explains what is good action and what is bad action? What is right and what is wrong? The one criterion is that that is good and right, which helps you to keep your mind in God. And evil or wrong is that which makes you forget God. So how can we choose between right and wrong? Swami Brahmananda explained, if through discrimination, you can impress upon your mind the joy and fullness of the spiritual life, and the folly of worldly attachments, it will devote itself more and more to God. This happens naturally. 
not something that we even have to force ourselves to do. As we grow in devotion, we go closer to God. And what happens? We grow away from the world, worldly attachments, baser emotions. So how can we discriminate? Swami Premananda, direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna advised, retire into solitude occasionally. Practice discrimination and self-analysis and try to discover the subtle obstacles that obstruct your path to spiritual progress. You will find that there are many subtle impressions, habits of thought and actions lying dormant and hidden in the subconscious regions of the mind. You see, you yourself will become the teacher. You will see for yourself as you witness the mind what is going on in the mind, Premananda Swami added. Analyze yourself in solitude, find out the obstacles, and then struggle without compromise to remove them. Now this going into solitude, you may ask, how can I go into solitude? Well, we have many retreat centers. Uh, I come from the Southern California Center. I go back twice a year. We have a lovely guest house where you can stay. We also have a convent and a center in beautiful Santa Barbara, up in the mountains, 10 minutes from the ocean, where there are wonderful rooms for devotees to, to go into quiet and to also associate with the nuns. We also have other centers with retreat centers where you can stay and have holy company and give yourself sort of an injection into spiritual life that becomes helpful. And you will find that once you try this, it will become something that you must do or feel you must do every year. It's something that rejuvenates the soul. Sutra 12, scriptures are to be followed as long as one's spiritual life is not firmly established in God, says Narad. So from his own experience, Sri Ramakrishna explained, one should hear the scriptures during the early stages of spiritual discipline. After attaining God, there is no lack of knowledge. Then the Divine Mother supplies it without fail. You become, you yourself become the scripture. You become self-realized. For spiritual aspirants, he used to say, do you know my attitude? Books, scriptures, and things like that only point out the way to reach God. After finding the way, what more need is there of books and scriptures? Then comes the time for action. Sutra 13. Otherwise, Narada says, there is a fear of falling from the ideal, and this can happen. Scriptures that stay with us and reinforce our devotion to God. And those of you who have come regularly, you have your favorite scriptures, those that you read every day. We be, read before meditation, read after meditation, and read in the evening. They are like holy company. You can't do without them. It was really amazing my first trip to India when I met Swami Mastananda, who was then the assistant secretary and later became one of the presidents of the order, disciple of one of the direct disciples, Swami Vigyanananda. He frankly told me, he said, I read the gospel every day. Swami Madhavananda, who was once president of the order, asked the monastics to read the gospel, just one or two pages every evening before bedtime. The gospel of Ramakrishna is chock full of advice both secular and sacred. And this Swami was one of the most active Swamis in the Ramakrishna order. Success just came to him. But at the time I was in India in 1979, our center in Cherapunji was in trouble. Uh, Christian missionaries had come in and tried to turn the tribals against the Ramakrishna mission. And the head of the center had to flee for his life. He had come to, this Swami Gokulananda had to flee to Belarmat. And so Swami Atmastananda, being in his station, had to go there and settle the problem. 
And so that night before he was to meet the tribal chief, he read in the gospel, Sri Ramakrishna saying, when you meet the tribal chief, offer him a smoke. And Swami Atmastananda did. And in that way, there was a rapport that was established. And aside from that, Swami Atmastananda knew the daughter of the chief who was a resident in the school. Dui Dui was her name. And he asked her to help him in his mission to settle the problem. And so when Atmastananda Swami left, all problems were dissolved. So even in secular matters, if we read with regularity, there is a rhythm that is established in our spiritual life. And the questions that we have, the answers do come. So these scriptures also help to prevent us from falling back on past negative impressions, rising in the mind and overtaking us. And this happens until we have the highest experience. So the scriptural reading is part of our sadhana, part of our tapasya, whether you're monastic or lay devotee. Sutra 14, Narada tells us, social customs and practices need only be followed until one's love for God grows intense. But acts such as eating, drinking, etc., which are necessary for the preservation of the body must not be given up. So here, our teachers are telling us to be moderate, practice moderation, and to follow the customs and the dress of our country of origin, to adjust to time, place, and circumstance. This was one of the key teachings that Ramakrishna gave Sri Sarada Devi. Adjust yourself to time, place, and circumstance. In other words, such externals as dress, food, language, are not the badge of spiritual life. Our interior life is the only true indicator. How much time we devote to our spiritual practices, how we treat others, how much time we devote to our meditation, karma yoga, mind control, and so on. And now we come to exemplars of divine love. In Sutra 15, Narada tells us, the characteristics of divine love have been described variously by sages because of differences in their viewpoints. So Narada himself includes various viewpoints, which may seem to be different in order to show the variety of ways and means to attain devotion. Truth is vast, and each sage expresses it differently because they have only experienced an aspect, just one aspect of that which is infinite. Hence, they are not contradictory but supplementary. Therefore, we find the dictum in the Rig Veda, ekam sad vipra bahuda vedanti, truth is one. Sages call it by various names. Now we come to Sutra 16. Narada tells us, Vyasa, son of Parasara, defines bhakti as devotion to acts of worship and the like. Swami Brahmananda, direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna and the first president of the Ramakrishna order explained, men differ in their temperaments and so are inclined to different ways of worship. To meet the needs of all, the scriptures prescribe four distinct methods of worship. One method is the ritualistic worship of God embodied in an image or symbol, and that is what we do here. Higher than this is the worship of God with prayer and japam. And this is also what we do here and in our homes. By this means, the aspirant prays and chants 
and meditates upon the shining form of his chosen ideal within his own heart. Now, these teachings of Swami Brahmananda are precious. They're actually on the reading list at our novices training center at Bellarmat. And I strongly recommend that you purchase that book and read those teachings. It's, the book itself is called The Eternal Companion. Swami Prabhavananda used to explain the efficacy of ritual worship to his monastics, and that was to us in Santa Barbara and Tribuco and the Hollywood centers. He used to tell us, once I was arranging a basket of flowers in Maharaja's room, meaning Swami Brahmananda's room, he entered the room and inquired if I had offered some flowers for worship in the shrine. The young Swami said, I answered no. And I thought to myself that the shrine merely contained a picture. He seemed to read my thoughts, Swami Prabhavananda continued, and he asked me, do you think there is nothing in the shrine but a picture? I replied rather nervously, yes. Then he asked me if I'd ever done any external ritualistic worship. I said, no, because I do not believe in it. Swami Prabhavananda continued, my master did not try to convince me by argument of the efficacy of ritualistic worship. He simply said, I am asking you to do it. I replied, I will obey you. He then said, on the third day of performing the ritualistic worship, I did not offer salt to Sri Ramakrishna with the offerings of cucumber and sweets. While making the food offering, it is usual to come out of the shrine, close the doors and meditate that the Lord is eating. But the day was hot. I was drowsy and lay down. A young Brahmin boy with a lighted body appeared to me and said, you did not offer Takur, meaning the master, any salt. Takur cannot take cucumber without salt. I got up and went to see Swami Atmananda to ask him about it. He said, yes, that is true. Takur could not eat cucumber without salt. I asked, what can be done? Swami Atmananda advised, take some salt, open the door of the shrine, place the salt on the food tray and then come out again. Swami ended by saying, thus it was proved to me in three days that the Lord accepts what we offer. And to this day in Southern California, during our food offerings, whether in Santa Barbara, Tubuco, San Diego, Hollywood, we always put a small vessel of salt on the tray. And here as well, on special puja days, we always put a special vessel of salt. Swami Prabhavananda later related, I was convinced of the truth taught in the Bhagavad Gita. We read in chapter 9, verse 26, Sri Krishna says, whatever man gives me in true devotion, fruit or water, a leaf, a flower, I will accept it. That gift is love, his heart's devotion. And if we can remember that, when we're mechanically offering, that actually the Lord is present and is accepting that offering in a subtle form, that increases our connection with God. Puja, and the Ramakrishna order is actually a non-dualistic worship. Yes, non-dualistic. We belong to the Shankara Dasanami. Yes, flowers and other items are offered to the photo or emblem of the Lord. Yes, you see that in the worship we do here. But the Pujari or Pujarini first meditates on one's union with Brahman. Swami Prabhupada explained. Then you meditate on your chosen ideal as Atman Brahman within the shrine of your own heart. Then you bring forth the Lord in your heart, place him in front of you and think of the picture or image as living. Then the 
Pujari offers flowers and other items, which have been worshipped as Brahman to the Lord, which is the symbol of Brahman. So through Brahman, with Brahman, to Brahman. So it's important to note that Shankara, Ramanuja, <clears throat> Sri Chaitanya, and Ramakrishna performed worship even after realization. And also it's important to note that when Swami Vivekananda came to this country, he wanted devotees to establish a shrine in their own home and make sure that that shrine had flowers on it and was used daily. Now, why? What's the purpose of a shrine? Well, when you come here, you feel something. And especially in our little shrine, where the work began in this Dallas Center. That's where all the pujas occurred, all the lectures, all the classes, all the initiations became just a spiritual vibration in our little shrine. And so whenever a devotee is in need, they ask to go to this little shrine. But so also in your home, there should be a place where you go every day and offer your meditation. What happens there? It builds up what is called tanmatras in that space. The space where you meditate, where you pray, where you sing, where you do your holy reading. And that atmosphere permeates the home. It uplifts the family. It helps you and your family members striving forward on the path to realization. And it's a place where you can go whenever you're in need. Sutra 17. The sage Garga defines bhakti as devotion to hearing and praising the name of God. Music is a core. It's a core part of almost all religious traditions. There is no exception in the Ramakrishna tradition. Swami Vivekananda himself was a fine singer, poet, and instrumentalist. Sri Ramakrishna would often ask him to sing for him. At one time, the Swami revealed, music is the highest art, and to those who understand, is the highest worship. Now, even, even when musical scales were being played in the presence of Swami Brahmananda, Swami Brahmananda always had a musician and singer with him wherever he went that would send him the songs, the music would send him into ecstasy. But a bystander complained that you know, this was secular and that jarred Maharaj. And he said, don't you know that sound is Brahman? Don't you know that sound is Brahman? Sri Ramakrishna would go into ecstasy at hearing a devotional song Now we come to the eight teachings of Sri Chaitanya, which opens with the verse, chant the name of the Lord and his glories unceasingly, that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire, worldly lust raging furiously within. Such is the power of chanting the name of the Lord. Ram Prasad, the great mystic and poet songwriter, who was born around 1720 in Bengal, was forced by poverty to work as an accountant in the household of Durgachara and Mitra for a monthly salary, just 30 rupees. But during his work hours, Ram Prasad used to write devotional songs to Mother Kali. When his fellow employees reported him to their employer, Durgachara and Mitra was so moved by reading Ram Prasad's work, he asked him to return to his village and compose songs to Mother Kali while continuing to pay his salary. Ram Prasad was later made court pundit to the Nawab Sirajudhola of Bengal. 
Sutra 18. The sage Sandilya defines bhakti as avoiding all distracting thoughts and taking delight only in the Atman. Now that sounds rather rigorous. In the previous aphorism, Garga emphasized attachment to the means, singing God's praises, whereas Shandilya emphasizes attachment to the higher self, which is God. How does this work? For example, Sri Ramakrishna used to meditate on God as an ocean. He explained that Totapuri would explain how Jnani meditates and thus how he learned to meditate. Sri Ramakrishna told others about his practice of meditation and how he would become absorbed. He said, everywhere is water. All the regions above and below are filled with water. Man, like a fish, is swimming joyously in that water. In real meditation, you will actually see all this. Sri Ramakrishna continued, take the case of the infinite ocean. There is no limit to its water. Suppose a pot is immersed in it. There is water both inside and outside the pot. The jnani sees that both inside and outside, there is nothing but the paramatman. Then what is this pot? It is I consciousness. Because of the pot, the water appears to be divided into two parts. Because of the part you seem to perceive, an inside and an outside. One feels that way as long as this pot of I exists. When the I disappears, what is remains. That cannot be described in words. In this connection, again, when I was in India in 1979, I had the blessed fortune of seeing the Brahmani of Kanyakumari. She was a knower of Brahman. And as Sri Ramakrishna often described, some of these Brahmagyanis would walk with a pack of dogs and children, and she indeed did. When I was standing just inside the threshold of the Kanyakumari temple, suddenly the atmosphere changed like just before an electrical storm or an earthquake. And there was a Brahmani of Kanyakumari walking, followed by dogs and children. And it is said that she, as a practice, following this example of a jar in the ocean, she would float in the ocean. This was a confluence of the three waters, the tip of India. She would float there in ecstasy the kind of meditation that both inside and outside was this consciousness of Brahman. And in this way, Sri Ramakrishna would meditate as a vessel also, dipped in that ocean of existence, consciousness, and bliss, but he would do it seated. It's a very, very strong, beautiful meditation on the bliss of the absolute. Sutra 19. Narada tells us. Narada gives these as a sign of bhakti. When all thoughts, all words, and all deeds are given up to the Lord, and when the least forgetfulness of God makes one intensely miserable, then love has begun. Well, now we think, oh dear, <laughs> where am I? So here, devotion is summarized by two aspects. First, self-surrender encompasses and includes every kind of sadhana. There is no place, no time, no action where we cannot practice sadhana. And second, the characteristic of extreme anguish when one is self-forgetful of God. 
Now we're a long way from that. But we can try to begin by offering as much as we can to God, our worship, our study, our ordinary activities. And if we can't do it during the day, if we forget, we can do it at the end of the day when we're seated before our shrine. Just offer everything as worship to the divine good and bad. Whatever you did successfully, whatever you did unsuccessfully, all that action is offered to God. But how can we learn to think of God every moment? Now that takes practice. Swami Brahmananda said, whatever you do, whether you are sitting or lying down or eating or working, pray constantly. See? If you have a mantra, if you've received a mantra from your guru, you can practice japam. You take that japam wherever you go. If not, prayer, remembrance, feel the Lord is seated within you. Swami Prabhavananda advised in his commentary, the moment you think of God, convince yourself that you are actually in his presence. In other words, use your spiritual imagination. Convince yourself that you are actually in his presence. Then long for him and pray to him that he may reveal himself to you. However, Swami Adbhutanandi, one of the direct disciples of Ramakrishna, he warned, if there is no dissatisfaction with the world, longing for God does not come. Now that's hard when you're young because you have your whole life in front of you. You have necessary ambitions, you have necessary attachments, you have all of that. But the older you get, the more experience you have in the world, you see that things, material things come and go. Whether through natural disaster, through misfortune, or just no longer having any use for them. And there's a natural renunciation that takes place. Not renunciation of friends and family, not in that way, but you see your family and friends in a different way with a greater love, a greater regard that comes from within. And that love is the love you feel the Lord has for you. And that, what, and that is what exudes through you. There are two beautiful passages in our scriptures that describe this longing for God. Sri Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, the 18th chapter, verses 65 and 66, give me your whole heart, love and adore me, worship me always, bow to me only, and you shall find me. This is my promise, who love you dearly. Lay down all duties and me, your refuge. Fear no longer, for I will save you from sin and from bondage. And in Sri Taitanya's eight teachings, we read, ah, how I long for the day when an instant separation from thee, O Govinda, will be as a thousand years when my heart burns away with its desire and the world without thee is a heartless void. Can you imagine feeling that for the Lord when we can feel the loss of a loved one in the same way as we feel for the Lord when we can have that feeling that is true longing and then the vision is very near. So at the pinnacle of bhakti, divine love, there is both an extreme joy of union accompanied by an extreme agony at the separation from one's beloved. 
And this is a very, very high state. What the gopis had, we cannot hope to attain that kind of love, that mad love. But according to our own capacity, our devotion can grow so that it is fulfilled with the Lord coming to us. So this longing for God is often described as the fire of renunciation. Literally, a fire takes place within the body of such great souls. This burning separation from God is not ordinary. Sri Ramakrishna said one day, I was passing back of the Kunti. <clears throat> when my whole body burst into flames, as it were, like the fire in a homa, I was unconscious three days. In that state, I couldn't move. I lay in one place. The earth that had stuck to my body while I was laying on the ground had become baked. I can't imagine such fire of renunciation. This fire of anguish in Rupa and Sanatana, two great disciples of Chaitanya, was as scorched leaves of a tree under which they sat. They scorched the leaves under the tree. The fire of Chaitanya's renunciation, Sarvabhoma poured sugar on his tongue. What happened? It evaporated instead of melting. And the fire of anguish and Radha's heart, it literally dried up the tears in her eyes. Sutras 20 and 21, Narada tells us, Examples exist of such perfect expressions of love as the gopis of Raja had it. Narada understood that divine love really happens like this. It is an extraordinary supernatural state of consciousness. The willpower of such a soul must be equally strong as to sustain such extreme and extraordinary states of consciousness. A great soul never manifests that tremendous pull that is going on in the heart. When the Brahmani, Sri Ramakrishna's tantric teacher, saw the master's mad yearning, and this supersedes any kind of human yearning, that of an Ishvara Koti or that of an avatar, we read in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, she recognized in him a power to transmit spirituality to others. Never before had she seen such devotion. She came to the conclusion that such things were not possible for an ordinary devotee, not even for a highly developed soul. Only an incarnation of God was capable of such spiritual manifestations. She proclaimed openly that Sri Ramakrishna, like Sri Chaitanya, was an incarnation of God. So we can't expect that kind of burning renunciation and devotion for God to erupt within us, but we can still feel a tremendous yearning for God. Narada gives the example of the gopis, the shepherdesses of Vrindavan. What is the experience of their love for Sri Krishna? <clears throat> Sri Ramakrishna described when Krishna suddenly disappeared in the act of dancing and playing with the gopis they were beside themselves with grief looking at a tree they said oh tree you must be a great hermit you must have seen Krishna otherwise why do you stand there motionless as if absorbed in samadhi looking at the earth covered with green grass, they said, O oh, earth, you must have seen Krishna. Otherwise, why does your hair stand on end? You must have enjoyed the thrill of his touch. Looking at the Madhavi creeper, they said, O oh, Madhavi, 
Give us back our madhava. The gopis were intoxicated with ecstatic love for Krishna. Sri Ramakrishna once revealed one of his experiences of the gopis and Sri Krishna. And this is a very telling example. Once at Shyambazar, a kirtan was arranged at Natabar Goswami's house. There I had a vision of Krishna and the gopis at Vrindavan. I felt that my subtle body was walking at Krishna's heels. So what are the characteristics of such love? Sri Ramakrishna described, there are certain signs by which you can know a true devotee of God. His mind becomes quiet as he listens to his teacher's instruction, just as the poisonous snake is quieted by the music of the charmer. There is another sign, he went on. A real devotee develops the power of assimilating instruction. The power of assimilating instruction. An image cannot be impressed on bare glass, but only on glass stained with a black solution, as in photography. The black solution is devotion to God. He went on. There is a third sign of a true devotee. The true devotee has controlled his senses. He has subdued his lust. The gopis were free from lust. And again, Sri Ramakrishna explained, as the tiger devours other animals, so does the tiger of zeal for the Lord eat up lust, anger, and the other passions. Once this zeal grows in the heart, lust and the other passions disappear. The gopis of Vrindavan had that state of mind because of their zeal for Sri Krishna. Vivekananda once explained the chemistry of this divine love. He said, here is the madness of enjoyment, the drunkenness of love, where disciples and teachers and teachings and books and all these things have become one. Even the ideas of fear and God and heaven, everything has been thrown away. What remains is the madness of love. It is forgetfulness of everything. And the lover sees nothing in the world except that Krishna and Krishna alone. When the face of every being becomes a Krishna, when his own face looks like Krishna, when his own soul has become tinged with the Krishna color, that was the great Krishna. Sutra 22. Although worshiping Krishna as their lover, the gopis never forgot his God nature. Sri Ramakrishna once revealed a very telling statement. Sri Krishna has a peacock feather in his crest. The feather bears the sign of the female sex. The significance of this, Sri Ramakrishna stated, is that Krishna carries Prakriti, the female principle, on his head. When Krishna joined the circle of the gopis to dance with them, he appeared there as a woman. That is why you see him wearing women's apparel in the company of the gopis. Unless a man assumes the nature of a woman, he said. He is not entitled to her company. Assuming the attitude of a woman, he can sport with her and enjoy her company. So the mystic, this mystic dance of Sri Krishna. So everything is in the gospel. That is the source of so many truths coming from this, the source of truth itself. 
Sri Krishna is also the representative of the absolute. Sri Ramakrishna revealed, the Gyanis think of God without form. They don't accept the divine incarnation. Praising Sri Krishna, Arjuna said, thou art the absolute. Sri Krishna replied, follow me and you will know whether or not I am Brahman absolute. So saying, Sri Krishna led Arjuna to a certain place and asked him what he saw there. I see a huge tree, said Arjuna, and on it I notice fruits hanging like clusters of blackberries. Then Krishna said to Arjuna, come near and you will find that these are not clusters of blackberries, but clusters of innumerable Krishnas like me hanging from the tree. In other words, the divine incarnations without number appear and disappear on the tree of the absolute Brahman. At another time, Sri Ramakrishna explained, Sri Krishna is none other than the ultimate Brahman. He practiced sadhana to set an example to others. And in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the gopis addressed Sri Krishna, thou art not only the darling baby of Yashoda, but thou art the innermost self in all beings. Sutra 23. If they did not have that knowledge that Krishna was God, meaning the gopis, then their love would have been similar to the base passion of a mistress to her paramour. Sutra 24, Narada says, in lust, there is only the desire for one's pleasure. One's happiness does not consist in making the beloved happy. However, in divine love, the object of love elevates the mind of the lover. The gopi's love for Krishna was selfless. Sri Ramakrishna explained the gopi's cherished ecstatic love for Krishna. There are two elements in such love, Inus and minus. Inus is a feeling that Krishna will be ill if I do not serve him. In this attitude, the devotee does not look upon his ideal as God. Minus is to feel that the beloved is my own. The gopis had such a feeling of mindness towards Krishna that they would place their subtle bodies under his feet, lest his souls should get hurt. In human love, individuals seek their own happiness. But in divine love, such as the gopis had for Sri Krishna, they sought to serve him. They sought to make him happy. Furthermore, the gopi's love was pure. What are the qualities of that purity? Swami Bhuteshananda points out in his commentary. It cannot be said that the gopis did not have the awareness of the greatness of God, but they did not give importance to it. In fact, they sang, <clears throat> you are not an ordinary person. You are the inner controller of all beings. It is as the self that you are controlling all beings. You are the supreme reality, the supreme truth. And that is why we consider you as our beloved. However, they considered him, Swami Buddha said, as their own. And therefore the greatness of Sri Krishna was not uppermost in the minds of the gopis. He was their own. In that kind of in intimacy, there is no boundary or condition to such love. Just as a mother loves her child as her child, not because the child is great, but because the child is her child. Swami Prabhupada in his commentary, Narada's way of divine love, 
summarized this exalted love by pointing out that in the imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, Akempis put these words into the mouth of the Lord by writing, thy regard for thy friend ought to be grounded in me. And for my sake is he to be beloved, whosoever he be. Without me, friendship has no strength, no continuance. Neither is that love true and pure, which is not knit in me. Shanti, Shanti.